Good afternoon. Um, I uh, just want to give you sort of a summary of my, a little bit more of a summary of my background. <clears throat> I come, you know, as a, as a clinical psychologist, uh, what I uh, worked on during graduate school was creating animal models of some of the people that I saw and treated. Uh, and this is how I uh, became interested in the brain, because it's very difficult to study this in, you know, rodent models. Um, so what I'm going to be showing you are some uh, fundamental principles that r essentially govern all types of memory. Uh, so what I'm really hoping that you'll get from this is uh, sort of the, a flexible understanding of how you can use these concepts for yourself uh, in your practice. So what is a memory? Capacity to encode, store, retain, recall information. Um, this is a very general term uh, because this encompasses many different processes. An engram, in particular, is the physical uh, alterations that occur whenever you have uh, a memory that's formed. So what does that mean? That means that uh, your brain is adapting with all of your exper experiences uh, on a sort of an ongoing basis. Uh, this means that, in a way, you're physically adapting to your experiences. They aren't just sort of, you know, in your... Uh, what I'm going to be talking about here, let me see if I'll do this. So what I want to first introduce to you is the idea that uh, a memory doesn't just encompass a, a single location in the brain. And this is because the brain doesn't work that way. The brain works like a network. Uh, this is a, a 4D a representation of the brain stretched onto two dimensions. This is the resting state brain. So if you ask someone to uh, go into an fMRI machine and just relax, let their mind wander, this is what their brain does. So the red areas and the you know, sort of yellow areas increase. Uh, their um, activity is correlated over time, over 10 minutes. The blue areas, their activity is not correlated at each point in time. So what you can see is that one brain region isn't ever acting alone. It's always a uh, sort of an assembly of brain regions that perform different functions. Uh, this means that whenever you have a memory, uh, such as your first kiss, I sort of introduced this on the, um, the teaser video, uh, whenever you think about your first kiss, and I want everyone to actually stop and think about it. Okay, really, seriously, stop and think about your first kiss. Who was it with? Where were you? Did you get those tingles? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, did he have bad breath? Did he have, like, too, too much saliva? Um, these, are, these are all things that, uh, because it was such a salient event, we still remember them uh, very uh, strongly because it was an emotional memory. And I'll sort of uh, explain a little bit more in a moment. Uh, but this means that all of the uh, details of those experiences, these emotional experiences, are sort of indelibly imprinted into your mind. Um, and just think about that. It, it's not just the, oh, I had a kiss once. Maybe you can even imagine what the room looked like. Or you can imagine what she was wearing or what he was smelling like. Maybe he'd just come home from uh, athletics practice and smelled like goat. Uh, that was actually mine. <laughs> uh, a lovable goat. Uh, um, but, but what this means is that uh, a single memory it has it sort of reflects this capacity to reach into different parts of the brain and draw both the visuals, the senses, uh, all of these different types of memory that we use in other situations. So this is a very you know general diagram of uh, all the different types of memories that we have, uh, sort of the different ways that we can study them. Um, your kiss has sort of versions of uh, engrams in all of the places that govern these, uh, these faculties. A lot of this, uh, many people think that the hippocampus is sort of the main memory area. It is, but it's sort of a grand central station. Memories don't stay there. They sort of camp out for a bit to get strong, strong and then they are directed to different parts of the brain where they're stored. 
And it's the hippocampus that remembers the pathway. So your kiss is actually more like a matrix where you, you go through different you know, layers of the brain. And the matrix that makes up your experience is how you access your kiss. There are not only uh, anatomical changes that allow you to do this, but also it becomes very efficient. Uh, because you have the pathway, the more you think about it, for example, uh, the more easy it is to access these memories. So it's use dependent. Uh, this is a fantastic adaptive uh, component of memories. Uh, and it's extremely convenient whenever we um, come to treating patients. So this is going to be fun. I want to give you sort of a sense of what we're really talking about whenever you know, I talk about memory activation. So this is uh, a small video of neurons. That's you thinking about your first kiss. So you can see there's this uh, uh, dependence between not only groups of neurons, how they transmit information, but also there's something about this that I want you to understand very closely. Uh, the structure of the neurons and their axons determines where that information goes. There are lots of quirky things about that, but that's, you know, the, the most basic level, that's it. Um, so at first, the function is constrained by structure just the anatomical pathways. But uh, with especially uh, uh, continued use, uh, function has the capacity to change the shape and the way that those pathways work. Uh, this is accomplished through not only different neuron shapes. So you can see that uh, these different uh, neurons would allow for you to access many different types of brain areas, uh, many different patterns. Uh, you know, depending on what uh, layer of the cortex you're in. But also, what really happens is there's an increase in dendrites, so the mossy uh, branchy parts that, uh, that uh, communicate the information, you know, with the synapses at the end, and the spines on those dendrites. So this is almost like, um, um, al almost like Braille in that, uh, if you were to you know, sort of feel your way across a, uh, you know, the corner of a dendrite, the pattern of spines and their shape and their size will dictate where the information goes. Um, and whenever we were looking at the picture of the, you know, the network, uh, it seems like that's such a tiny change. How could that affect anything? And yet this is part of this global assembly of uh, neurons. So it has a global effect, especially whenever there are a few uh, neurons placed together. So here's sort of an example of that. Uh, with learning, these are physical changes that occur in neurons that reflect the learning that's uh, happened. And sometimes there's an addition of spines, dendritic spines, sometimes there's the removal. What I want you to understand from this is that, uh, you know, whenever you see uh, brain imaging studies about reductions in gray matter, for example, or changes in you know, atrophy. This is how that happens. It's at a micro, it's a tiny scale, but it's use dependent. And uh, because it's so uh, sort of responsive to your environment and your you know, ongoing experiences, uh, this, uh, within a few hours, you can start to see dendritic spine growth. Um, so this is also quite responsive to uh, the rate of learning. I like metaphor. Um, one of the things that uh, you might have heard this term synaptic efficacy. That means that uh, sort of a pathway becomes more efficient at transmitting information. And whenever I think of this, I think of water flowing down a mountain. And what does water do? It follows the path of least resistance. And if water's already flown, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, gone down a certain pathway, other water is more likely to go there too. So you create sort of these uh, streams turned into rivers of uh, sort of memory traces 
uh, this is how, this is essentially how um, synaptic uh, pathways are strengthened. Uh, essentially, uh, the stronger um, the, uh, the stronger the, it's interesting because it's, it's not only the strength and the amount of information that's coming through, it's also the, the timing. So um, there's some really interesting information uh, sort of trying to uh, um, suggest that the timing of uh, introducing two types of information together at once can determine whether it will be remembered or forgotten. Uh, whenever you look at, uh, you know, for instance, uh, gamma or theta oscillations, papers like that, this is what they're talking about, sort of the pattern of oscillations. And this is essentially like revolutions per minute. How fast is information being cycled through your brain? That's sort of what the oscillations do. And let's see if this works. Okay. So, I want to try to make this as um, straightforward as possible. So let's say that there's a pathway. This is information and it's going in a certain pattern. And the more information goes through that pattern, the more intricate it becomes. This is a memory trace. This is sort of like an engram. Uh, these you know, different dots may be in very different parts of the brain, but this is essentially what it looks like. It's almost like a tree branch. Um, I'll be coming back to that in just a moment uh, because uh, tree branches can change quite dramatically. The first part uh, to understand is the consolidation of memories. This essentially means how are memories formed? How would an engram even become? Uh, there are about four hours of critical time uh, whenever you first learn something that determine whether it'll stay with you. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about, it's called an encoding window. And it's essentially, if you start a new type of learning, your brain has just a time-limited uh, capacity to take in new information. After that, it has a series of uh, changes, including protein synthesis, that are starting to solidify the memory already. You've missed your window. So let's say you have a, a PT, like just a session with a patient. Uh, if it were to last four hours, or if you know, there was to be something that were very novel in it, there's a window of time, maybe an hour before, two hours after your hour um, session, that their brain is primed to process whatever they just learned with you. If you wait, for example, you know, six hours and have a PT session after you know, that learning, or um, six, six hours is a bit too much. There's something strangely magical about four hours. Uh, and what you can do is you can actually try to play around with this. Oh, oh, where is it? Well, you can play around with this. I, it might be a little bit uh, ahead. You can play around with this at four hours. You can add certain uh, sort of components to strengthen the memory. You can add caffeine. You can add uh, amphetamine. If you're looking at rodents, you can add the scent of a sexually potent female. <laughs> if you're a male rodent. Anything that increases salience, if it's delivered right after the critical learning, that will enhance whatever was right before it. So that's a very simple way to strengthen learning. So, and rather than coffee before <clears throat> you study, you should have coffee right after. But also there are some things that you can do beforehand to like prime uh, the person to, um, to remember as well as possible. Uh, who has heard of decycloserine? with uh, like phobia treatments and decycloserine, yeah? So decycloserine is an old tuberculosis drug. Uh, and one thing that they noticed was that uh, many of the people with tuberculosis, if they were depressed, they weren't so depressed after taking this medication. That was the first sort of inkling that they had that this did something uh, therapeutic. Uh, it isn't quite clear how it does it, uh, but whenever you have a, a stressed or a, an organism that's stressed out or in pain, uh, this drug can cross the blood-brain barrier and strangely, it binds specifically to the basolateral amygdala. This is the fear learning core. This is the, like the hot spot, this is where it's at. 
in terms of creating fear memories, uh, lasting fear memories. And what it does, decyclosterine uh, can sort of turn down the volume of whatever is being processed at that time. So, for instance, there are quite a few people who are doing uh, research on phobia uh, who give decyclosterine about an hour before an exposure session to uh, sort of maximize the effect of reducing the fear that's associated with uh, whatever the, the stressor is that they're, you know, that they're exposing the patient to. There are rules, however. So we talked about the sort of critical first four hours, or sorry, yeah, four hours. This takes about two weeks to solidify, but uh, you see longer term changes over weeks to months. And you'll even see longer term changes over years to a lifetime. So the sort of the processing of a memory doesn't stop at any one point if it's continually accessed. Uh, and it can continue to create uh, both structural and functional changes uh, throughout the lifetime of the memory. Pain is special, though. We all know this. Pain is the only sense that doesn't habituate. So if you think about other senses, the last bite of cake that was so delicious, the first, you know, the first time you had it and you just it looked beautiful, the last bite is not that great. It's good, but it's not as great. Or you know, after a while, you get used to how the cheese smells and you enjoy it. Or perhaps you live near an airport, and the airplane that annoys the hell out of you, uh, you just start to get used to the sound and you don't notice it anymore. All of the other senses work like that, except for pain. And it sort of makes sense, because why would you want to get used to pain if it means that there's going to be some sort of bodily injury uh, that's occurring? Um, so pain is, that's one of the reasons why pain is called a primary reinforcer in that inherently without any type of conditioning or learning, people and animals will avoid whatever just caused the pain. That means that uh, it's a very potent learning signal. Um, so even just baseline, even without uh, augmenting the uh, suffering associated with pain, for instance with chronic pain, you already have the ingredients for strong memory. Acute pain and chronic pain are different uh, for some important reasons. Uh, a lot of times I think that people think that chronic pain is simply acute pain that lasts for a really, really, really long time, but it operates on different rules. Uh, so not only uh, does it you know, have a, temporal, a different temporal scale, three to six months um, after the injury, if you know what the injury was, it uh, doesn't necessarily need to be evoked. It could be spontaneous in nature. Um, the more quirky thing about it is that it can be uh, triggered by emotional information, not just sort of nociceptive input. And this means that it's affecting a different part of the brain, not purely sensory encoding regions. It's also affecting the, sort of the reptilian emotional brain. And this can have a really a large... Uh, a scale effects on the brain I'll show you in just a moment. What I'm trying to get at here is that chronic pain is emotional. Normal pain is emotional to begin with, but chronic pain becomes inherently emotional. So it doesn't follow the same rules, yes. So how do we know that it's emotional? One thing is that whenever we look at brain regions that uh, encode just normal pain in healthy people, uh, you see like this very, it's called the pain matrix, which really isn't a pain matrix, but uh, there's a sort of a reliable group of regions that activate in fMRI studies whenever you have pain. And so, you know, the, obviously the people uh, made the assumption that this is just how pain, all pain occurs. However, you'll see that with the chronic pain conditions, you don't have the same types of activation, some of the same activation, but you'll also notice that, for instance, the MPFC medial prefrontal cortex, you have an increase in information. The PFC uh, is, uh, specializes in emotional learning. So this is the first indication that we had. This is uh, some of the best evidence I know of that uh, chronic pain is emotional. So 
This is a study from uh, Vanya Apkarian's lab. Um, he did a, a five-year longitudinal study, a five-year uh, project, uh, where he followed people for a year. He'd find them within the first two to three months of having back pain, low back pain. Uh, and he wanted to see if he could uh, predict who would have pain a year later based purely on their brain activity or questionnaires or their brain uh, structure. Uh, so over several uh, time points, four time points over the year, he scanned these brains. And uh, after, it was a huge study, um, over 150 people were in it. Uh, afterward, uh, conveniently, there were about half of them that got better, half of them didn't. If you use a better being a 30% decrease in pain or more, right there. So the people who recovered, you see these typical brain regions. These are the typical uh, pain matrix type brain regions that essentially process sensory information right here. And you can see that in both groups, it's very similar. It's the first few months. It's still essentially a sensory experience. All of, all of the patients show this. However, in the individuals who uh, recover, you see sort of a diminishment of that over time, essentially because they can't rate pain anymore. They don't have it. So you won't find just spontaneous pain activity. Um, that's another thing I should mention. This is uh, without any stimulus. This is just ongoing back pain moment to moment throughout a 10-minute scan. Persisting, however, you see a, an incredible uh, change from the sensory encoding regions to emotional regions, amygdala, nucleus accumbens. Essentially, after a year, the people who continue to have back pain, whenever they perceive the experience of pain, emotional regions are producing those sensory perceptions. Um, that's incredible. Uh, it's, uh, and so this sort of gets the idea that not only is it not necessarily something in the periphery or in the spinal cord that's driving some of this pain, um, there's a, essentially a long-standing emotional change in the brain that's starting to maintain this, this pain. And if we don't treat the emotional aspect of pain, will this part resolve? I don't think so. Um, I think that, uh, I'll sort of introduce this later on, but I think that you can uh, sort of parse uh, peripheral versus spinal versus brain uh, contributions to pain and be able to, you know, based on symptoms, have at least some sort of estimate. Uh, and they might require different treatments for each of them. You know, there might need, you know, like parallel treatments. Um, but for this, if you have an individual who's essentially suffering, their suffering is creating the perception of pain, um, this requires a very different treatment approach. So I could show a picture of someone who's depressed, and it would be very similar to this, to that sort of emotional signature, or you know, someone with PTSD. Uh, some of the ana anatomical changes that we see, it's very similar. So what does that mean if chronic pain essentially becomes an emotional uh, state of suffering? One thing it means is that all of those dendrites and the, you know, the processes that we looked at before, those start to have a dramatic change in the shape of the brain. So over this year-long period, uh, the sensory, for instance, I have the insula here, which is uh, involved in sensory encoding, uh, not only the magnitude, but the sort of the tracking of the pain, uh, and the right nucleus accumbens. So the right nucleus accumbens is more sort of reward-related, insula, sensory-related. In the uh, black boxes, that's the persisting group. Essentially, by about 10 weeks or so, uh, people who are going to continue to have pain for a year start to lose neurons or dendrites or you know, those processes we were looking at in their insula. They also, a little bit, there's sort of a lag behind it, they start to lose, uh, oops, they start to lose uh, those same, you know, the same structural components in the nucleus accumbens, which is more reward related. Over time, this has a cumulative effect 
that may uh, essentially reorganize the entire structure of the brain. So the last one, the global disruption in gray matter, this is uh, from a, a single index that was calculated on um, how uh, disrupted uh, brain region to brain region uh, correlations were, but across the whole brain. So it's a, it's a tricky uh, index. But it essentially means globally how much change is occurring. And if you plot people based on the duration of pain that they've experienced, you see a very rapid increase in reorganization over the first 10 years or so that stabilizes. So again, we have a potentially a critical window where the first 10 years are really key. And after that, I'm not sure. I actually have no idea whether uh, the, uh, those would be more or less uh, difficult um, to sort of disrupt those sort of um, brain changes. But this means that not only are individual regions changing, but the whole brain and all the relationships between areas in the brain are changing as well. This is a different brain. I'd argue it's a different nervous system than a normal person. So you're dealing with a nervous system with different rules uh, that don't make sense, um, but they don't make sense in very reliable ways. Um, let's see. This is, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Kareem Nader. So the old, old idea was that once a memory is stored. Can, is there a way to, in terms of the sound, to, I could, I could put this up there. Sorry. So Kareem Nader um, is a professor at McGill University. He was the person who sort of came up with this thing called memory reconsolidation, which uh, was a discovery that all of those, thank you, all of those uh, changes that happen uh, whenever you have a memory essentially reoccur whenever you recall the memory. His paper was rejected for about a year by many different journals because people didn't believe it. So he came from Joseph Ledoux's lab, who's like, like one of the memory researcher gods. Um, and even from that, even with Ledoux's uh, name on it, people didn't believe it. Uh, so this is actually, in this context, it's a, it's a wild uh, reinterpretation of memory that people have taken many years to accept. Because before, they thought that a memory trace, once it's created, is always there. And this suggests that you could fundamentally change uh, the content of that. Let's see. Okay. So the old, old idea was that once a memory is stored, then it stays stored. Uh, so that was probably. Ooh. Apologies. So the old, old idea was that once a memory is stored, then it stays stored. Uh, so that was problematic for treating conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, where you know the, the time course of the memory becoming stored is on the order of hours. So if you want to treat them by targeting consolidation of their traumatic memory, you have to treat them within a few hours. Uh, and of course, the problem is most people don't go to a clinic for, say, a year or more time after the trauma. And by that time, the memory has already been, according to theory, wired into the brain. And so some work that I, I did when I was in Joseph Ledoux's lab showed that even though a memory has been fixed in the brain or consolidated, when you remember it or when an animal remembers it, it can become unconsolidated, unstored in some ways, and it has to be restored. And what that does is it gives clinicians a time window during which they can try to target the memory or psychopathology by targeting the mechanisms that mediate the abnormal behavior. Okay. So we remember the trace, the memory trace before. Let's see if this works. So let's say you have a new memory. What you need to do, ideally, with the new memory that you create is uh, recruit the old memory as well the original memory trace in order to 
create this new pathway to where whenever someone evokes the, you know, the same sort of initial cues, um, that old pathway no longer exists. So this is, uh, I'm gonna show you something that is just very convincing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's from a documentary called Memory Hackers. Um, and it, uh, it essentially shows someone uh, getting over a lifetime uh, phobia in 24 hours. So can you tell me a bit more about your fear of spiders? And when I sleep I, and I dream about it, I'm just very scared. Uh, for the treatment, we will walk to the other side of the room. And there is a um, terrarium uh, tank with a tarantula in it. I'm going to ask you to touch the tarantula. <laughs> okay? They're not poisonous, right? Uh, yeah, well, all uh, tarantulas are, are poisonous. <laughs> Walk to the yellow line. It's very good. You are doing very good. Yeah. <laughs> Just like with Nader's rats, the first step is to get Jaron to draw up the memory of his fear. You're doing very good. We ask our participants to approach the uh, tarantula, which triggers the original uh, fear memory. How much distress do you feel right now? Dry mouth. Yeah. I feel shaking. Yeah. You are doing very, very well. And try to look here. Don't avoid it. Yeah. Stay here. It's important that you see it. Yeah? Just put your hand here. And then stop. Yeah? What do you think that will happen? Approaching the spider makes the fear memory unstable. Yeah. Okay. Very good. We go to the other side of the room. Such that if we give propanolol after the uh, exposure to the tarantula, uh, the drug can interfere with the restabilization of the original fear memory. We'll discuss propranolol. We are going to do this again, uh, walking to the other side of the room. And I'm going to ask you again to touch the uh, spider. And you can touch it here at the back side. <laughs> Very good. Did you touch it? Yeah. Did you feel it? Yeah. Okay, try it again. <laughs> <laughs> Rubber. Yeah, so try it again. Oh, man. Okay. It takes a few tries, but after just minutes. Do it again. Very good. Yes. 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 How does it feel if you touch the tarantula? Well, like touching a hamster. Yeah. Maybe he likes it. So that's fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I'll. So propranolol. I'll, I'll discuss this in just a second, but it's essentially a beta blocker uh, that can be used to. Uh, interrupt um, the some of the mechanisms that helped initiate protein synthesis, which is what's necessary to create a memory. So after he f very fully activated it that first day, um, you know, she said it's important that you look at it. It's a, you know she had him put her or put his hand very near it to like increase fear as much as possible. That's one of the crazy weird things about this. Activating the fearful memory, activating what you fear as strongly as possible will make it more effective. Right? Um, he takes this 24 hours later. Uh, you should be able to see an effect. You know, this is based on rodent studies. 24 hours later, essentially the memory, uh, that, uh, that strong pain memory had been dampened or completely you know, removed. The assumption is that it was reconsolidated. 
uh, and they found that uh, a year later, uh, they still, all of the subjects in this study still were not fearful of spiders. So this is the first study, uh, Merrill Kint, uh, the first study to show very convincingly in humans that reconsolidation is uh, applicable to, uh, to clinical situations. Some people from Harvard had tried it before, but they didn't fully activate the memory. Um, they had uh, people with, uh, I think, PTSD write about some of their traumas. That wasn't sufficient. He's actually interacting with his fear. What was the name of the movie? Memory Hackers. I'll, I'll make sure. I'll, uh, all of these uh, slides will be online, so you can uh, download them, and that information is on there. So what are the components? The reactivation of his fear very effectively. <laughs> the use of memory-specific cues. So look at the spider. What do you think will happen, is what she said. That's really important because it's not the emotions that are actually driving this, uh, this memory, this uh, pathological memory. It's over time, it's the thoughts that um, the emotions are sort of related to. The emotions are epiphenomena. She's trying to find his core belief, that core schema, that you know, what will happen if you actually interact with the spider. Uh, and that was something that was formed the first time either he you know, ever saw a spider, uh, but there's sort of a little element of it that's reconjured up every time he would experience it. But what she did is she maximized the strength of the activation by having him interact with it. Uh, so, for instance, uh, in desensitization, uh, uh, you know, exposure therapy using desensitization, the idea is to try little bit by little bit to get them to, the patient uh, to relax with um, increasingly uh, scary or upsetting stimuli. This suggests that the most effective way would be to have them go full force at the top. Uh, one of the things that's always necessary with uh, any of those uh, processes, like the desensitization and the flooding, is that the person is more relaxed at the end than they began. And almost across the board, if they're more relaxed afterward, the memory will be encoded as less strong. But you can r manipulate this in some ways that uh, make it uh, much more useful. So. Again, uh, the other part that's important here is the contradictory experience he had. It's really, so th I didn't, I cut that part out, but he said it's really confusing, like a contradiction. What's necessary is the old uh, memory and the new realization are recognized at the same time together. That the person understands consciously that they can't both exist. They can't both be right. So, for instance, if uh, you have a patient who, no, I can't do this, I, I, can't, I can't play basketball anymore, I can't, uh, no, it'll hurt too much, and you get them revved up enough to try, and they have fun, and maybe, you know, a little bit of a delayed muscle soreness, who knows, but the fact that they did something that they thought that they would never be able to do again, maybe it hurt, yeah, that's fine, but they were able to do it something that violates their expectations is uh, one of the drivers of this phenomenon. Yes. Oh, that part of it is cut off. Um, let's see, in the interest of time, uh, this is a, sort of a, uh, a schematic of the reconsolidation uh, window. So after the original encoding, it's a reconjuring up of that whole pathway. There are two types of it. In the literature, people often don't distinguish between these two, and they have very different, uh, circum er, different uh, consequences. What we saw was an example of a retrograde amnesia blocking type approach to reconsolidation. So that's whenever you have something that, um, a memory that's uh, conjured up, and you take something that prevents protein synthesis from occurring. Notably, alcohol, uh, large amounts of alcohol do this as well. Alcohol-induced blackout. Um, so there's an old study, 2003 or so, showing with a reconsolidation paradigm that large amounts of alcohol could do this as well. 
but uh, also ECT. Uh, there are some studies from the 60s showing that uh, the most successful ECT uh, uh, therapies were the ones where they didn't give them some sort of medication to dole them out, that they had them uh, sort of reactivate their pathology, whether they were schizophrenic or postpartum depression. Uh, if they brought that up before, right before they received the treatment, that memory trace was reactivated, uh, that you know, specific memory trace was reactivated and disrupted through the uh, electrical currents. The other type, uh, sort of approach, yeah, it's taken immediately after. And this is an important thing. If you take it six hours after, no good. Um, the other sort of approach is updating. And it's not that they're different processes, it's just manipulating different parts of it. Rather than uh, focusing on um, removing the protein synthesis, uh, sort of fortification of the, of the memory, you're focusing on strengthening the learning. Uh, so this is, for instance, preloading with decycloserine is one example, postloading with caffeine, also uh, Viagra. <laughs> there is a study suggesting that. And in the scent of a, of a sexually potent female will also do this. <laughs> um, so those are, those are a couple of ways to sort of optimize. And it depends on what you're working with, right? Um, it m depends on whether there's a way to create a contradictory memory. Uh, something that I don't, uh, that I uh, sort of left out, there's the idea that um, if there are people who are vulnerable to uh, pain or mood disorders because of early dis uh, sort of experiences, um, maybe they didn't have an original memory trace related to what they're afraid of now. But those early traces, or sorry, the early experiences uh, potentiated pathways that could be very easily recruited with the right stimulus, such as pain. So that's a one hypothesis in terms of how uh, something you know, completely different that happened years ago, early childhood trauma, could actually affect your experience of a symptom that you know, develops um, you know, with a single event. And we sort of go out of there. Yep, contradictory experience is key. <laughs> how, do you know if you, how do you know if it worked? Uh, one way is the symptoms reduce or resolve. Uh, they don't have that stress response, but also it seems effortless. So you notice the young man, he was laughing, almost giggling. Yeah, it's, uh, it wasn't, he wasn't trying, he wasn't uh, inhibiting anything. That's a sign of a, of a positive <laughs> outcome. Troubleshooting. Different memories might have different traces. Uh, for instance, if you had depression whenever you were younger, it's continued through and then you developed chronic pain. Those might have distinct memory traces even though they build upon one another. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind uh, depending on you know, the patient that you're working with. Older, more intense memories require more work to reactivate um, just because they've had many, many years of fortification that you have to sort of fight through. Um, if you have a patient who uh, has defenses that um, they've relied on for many years to protect them from uh, sort of confronting uh, the reality of what they've been through, uh, they won't implicitly or explicitly, they may not want to reactivate the memory or engage you know, in this way. Um, and you know, that's up to, on one hand, uh, defenses are there for a reason and never unpack what you can't you know, pack up before the end of the session. Uh, but um, if you, essentially, they would be unwilling to, um, to fully reactivate. Uh, so that might need a little bit of um, work beforehand uh, with them. Also, pain is not solely uh, perpetuated by the brain. There can be peripheral and spinal mechanisms that are distinct. Here's something from a, a clinical trial that I just recently finished uh, on men with chronic pelvic pain. This is decycloserine, that medication I talked about before. Uh, whenever, you do, whenever you give someone uh, decycloserine chronically, it does, essentially it reduces uh, the 
uh, negative effective memory, uh, but at a slower pace because it's working at the synapse level, which is very slowly. So if you see an effect, you'll see it like clockwork uh, six to eight weeks. And like clockwork, uh, this gentleman had a drop in about uh, two, two-ish units of pain. But it didn't get rid of all of his pain. That's whenever it comes, uh, sort of the acute aspect comes into play. Um, I'm going to sort of breeze through some of this. One of the tricky things uh, that uh, you should remember is that uh, somatic pain, which is uh, bone, skin, muscle versus visceral pain, organ pain, uh, the former would probably be more easily identifiable as a cue, whereas visceral pain, because it's delayed often from the stimulus, uh, it, the learning aspect might be a bit more tricky. There are certain things that sensitize nerves. This is a very important slide. Uh, very few times are all of these uh, sort of mechanisms listed together. These are all the ways that a peripheral nerve can change its function and increase the efficacy with which it processes or you know it passes on uh, pain information. Um, inflammation does this all the time, so this isn't this isn't anything special. Spinal cord central sensitization uh, is also not terribly special unless, uh, for instance, um, if you have a sunburn, that's central sensitization. Uh, the, it acts, uh, there's sort of the amplification of the uh, signal just like there is in the periphery. The only distinct part about it is the temporal dissociation uh, between the stimulus and the continued signal. So. With central sensitization, uh, with a sufficiently strong signal from the periphery, uh, you can take the periphery, you know, you can take that signal away and you'll continue to see spinal cord interneurons firing as if it were still there. Uh, this has only been shown, and I know this is a big, this is an interesting thing right now. This has only been shown in humans experimentally for two and a half weeks. We extrapolate a lot <laughs> from this idea. And it's, I believe that, you know, that this plays a role, but I think that uh, we need to be a little more careful in terms of how um, sure we are that uh, central sensitization is, is doing the work that we see. Um, and this is uh, from Wolf's original study, but I'll keep on going through that. Let's see. Um, in terms of trying to dissociate the symptoms between the periphery, spinal, and brain, uh, these are some general patterns that would give you that information. So uh, often, for instance, I typically note all of the sensory abnormalities, but pay attention specifically to the ones that indicate spinal cord alterations, the wind-up, uh, but also uh, visceral, um, well, dynamic mechanical allodynia can um, sort of manifest as uh, if they don't wear belts, they don't want to wear certain types of clothing. Um, they'll also be... Um, uh, after sensations that again are dissociated from the uh, pain stimulus. And not to fear, this doesn't just uh, completely erase your memories, it only erases the nasty parts of them. Um, it's a little, actually that's not totally true. Uh, you can create some, you can create some uh, false memories uh, if you look at this uh, movie, the, the Memory Hackers. Um, they have some nice examples of that. Take home points, I'm going to really just go through this. Essentially, there's some really strong evidence that chronic pain is maintained like an emotional memory. That means you need to treat it like an emotional memory. Uh, we have, fortunately, a way to do that. So whatever can be learned, fortunately, can be unlearned. So learning will be the key that you know, helps to, uh, yeah, to that helps to uh, treat a group of people who, um, who still don't have, I mean, it's interesting that, um, I think we've all seen lots of people with chronic pain. Uh, they all uh, sort of often uh, organize their identities around pain. They, you know, change how they act, how they go out during the day, if it's a good day, bad day, you know, That'll determine whether they see their friends. It'll determine whether they get dressed. Whenever they organize their entire identity around pain, 
Um, that's sort of the magnitude of emotional memory we're talking about. Um, so I would love to have questions right now and <laughs> talk about this. So we're going to we're going to need a, a microphone up here in the in the front row and then uh, a, this next microphone in the third row over here. Um, so we're going to take a, a few questions and then we're going to have a quick word from our coffee sponsor Geofit and then um, we are going to get as many of our presenters from this week uh, up on stage all at once so that if you want to take a quick group picture you can uh, before they all go off into different directions. So uh, our first co uh, question right up front here, Jeff. I'm Jeff, and uh, thank you very much. I feel like I need two or three months to digest that. That's a, in, a good, in a good way. Um, you mentioned a couple times about uh, how certain substances can be given to a person, like caffeine, uh, immediately after a learning experience to help block that in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of us here that are manual therapists I'm assuming, you know, uh, think of our work as at least partly educational, not entirely mm -hmm. therapeutic, and maybe some of us consider it entirely educational. If we're working with someone, say for ex instance, we're trying to help them to learn to more accurately assess their body image or to be able to sense their body from within, or even to learn pain education points, what can we do to help that new learning be better preserved? Uh, the nice thing is, uh exactly what I suggested <clears throat> and that um, some of these uh, things such as you know giving caffeine right after learning uh, regardless of the task in rodents it could be uh, learning a, a sort of a fear odor or it could be learning uh, some sort of operant task uh, so motor memories as well like various types of memories uh, can all benefit from this um, and if someone doesn't drink caffeine anything that increases that's highly rewarding that would increase salience. So for example, uh, if someone loves video games, that increases dopamine uh, pretty quickly. So anything that, that, uh, that uh, increases those neurochemicals at that point in time. Another thing that I, I should mention is that it's, even though I said four hours, it's probably hours one to four uh, that's probably the most critical. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Great. We have our next question over here, and then the, uh, and then we'll have a question in the front row over here. I think that pretty much was heading toward where, what I was about to ask. If, are there things that will trigger like endogenous protein, like endogenously block protein synthesis? So you're saying doing something that they enjoy can well, the, do that. So the thing with, um, so the. You know, I had the blocking versus <clears throat> updating you know, interpretations. Uh, if you're trying to increase the, uh, the salience of whatever they just learned, you don't want to block the protein synthesis. You want to, you, you want to keep that there uh, for sure. So this is, this is why uh, you need to tweak. Um, for the blocking approach, if it's something that's extremely uh, sort of unmanageable, uh, maybe they can't articulate it, maybe they can't articulate a core belief that can be disrupted. Um, it's, it's more of a, a broad approach. Uh, and technically the relearning, the sort of updating approach would be more specific and probably more effective. But it depends. Um, yeah. So keep protein synthesis, other things to do afterward, post-loading, um, uh, incorporating different uh, senses, multi-sensory learning. Um, yeah. Okay. Especially we, if it's a procedural memory. And we have the front row right over here. Hi, I'm Brooke. Um, so are there any studies that are using the um, beta blockers in chronic pain right now? I think I remember one on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, there, the application of uh, reconsolidation to chronic pain is very new, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people don't 
It's, it's just a very new concept. So very few people are even thinking about it right now. Yeah, it would just be really interesting if we could have people go through mo like movements like um, getting your shoe where they are very scared about that mm -hmm. and using the beta blocker to um, just kind of desensitize and so they don't have as much anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. And you could do that clinical trial on your own with some alcohol. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, know, okay. Like Propranolol is something that uh, docs will give uh, musicians for stage fright. So it's, it's not, it's a very old drug. It's super cheap. Um, I'm not telling people to do tons of drugs, but, uh, you know, it isn't uh, something that um, isn't accessible. But also, alcohol. <laughs> okay, we have one more question from our, uh, one of our online participants. This question comes from Chandra. Which professional groups would be utilizing this type of treatment, especially for populations who have chronic pain for 10 years or longer? Thank you, Chandra. Um, that's an excellent question. So I think that, honestly, the, the most obvious answers are physical therapists, psychologists, um, psychiatrists, anyone who has time to interact with uh, a patient. So some doctors may or may not have that time uh, available. It also takes sort of pre-planning. Um, I think that, I'm trying to think of who wouldn't be able to apply it. I think that um, one thing that I would suggest uh, that uh, would determine probably the success or failure is that there's a strong relationship between the provider and the patient, the healer and the sufferer, because things tend to work better you know, across the board whenever that happens. Um, so I would suggest that uh, if you have a PT or therapist or psychiatrist or physician who the person, you know, they really get along with, they trust, they, um, yeah, they trust that they'll help them, that would probably be an indicator of a more successful intervention. Great, thank you very much. Everyone, please give a hand.